our session this morning, which from 8 to 9, will be uh, a uh, medical journal editor's panel. And so I will introduce the medical journal editors who are here. This is an impressive lot. Um, immediately to my left is Fiona Godley, who's editor-in-chief of the BMJ. Um, she has been editor-in-chief since 2005, and before that she led the development of BMJ clinical evidence, which many of you are probably also familiar with. Um, she's also been the president of the World Association of Medical Editors, and I just like the name of an organization called WIMI, and chairs the Committee on Publication Ethics and uh, Peer Review in Health Sciences, so uh, an expert in the area. Robert Steinbrook, who is editor-at-large at JAMA Internal Medicine, um, and has also been a contributing writer for JAMA. He's an internist, um, previously deputy editor and national correspondent for the New England. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if you can speak for the New England Journal or just about the New England Journal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can always speak about the BMW. <laughs> and the Los Angeles Times. I don't know if you can speak for or about the Los Angeles Times either. And then on the far end, Dr. Deborah Cotton, who is deputy editor of Annals of Internal Medicine and also uh, professor of medicine at Boston University and epidemiology at the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, she has a long resume in infectious disease and has been the deputy editor of Annals of Internal Medicine since 2009. So I am delighted to welcome all three of them, and we're going to ask each one of them to speak briefly about their journal and what their journal does and uh, how possibly their journal might be involved in solving the problem of overdiagnosis, and then we will open the floor up to questions. So I'm going to start at the other end. Oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I better get in gear. <clears throat> I had a card, but I don't need you can, it. You can sit or you can sit, oh, I don't whatever works. What slides? would be better? Either way. Um, as Virginia mentioned, I'm actually an infectious diseases physician. I've spent most of my career doing AIDS. And I suppose for screening, AIDS is the, is the optimal uh, situation now, because basically the US PSTF says uh, HIV screening is recommended for all people between the ages of 15 and 65. For people under 15 or over 65, it's recommended if they're at greater risk. So an amazing achievement over about 30 years. Uh, although we went back and forth about screening, we went back and forth about when to uh, test, how to treat, when to treat, many of the things that we're all dealing with now very compressed. However, because of the miracle of our patients surviving, uh, they all are getting cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, or at risk for prostate cancer, breast cancer, et cetera. So we are dealing with the same issues um, as many, many of you. And in addition, there's some indication uh, that the disease itself may accelerate risk or accelerate aging and therefore put people at risk. So we are dealing all the time with when and how to test as well. Um, as Virginia mentioned, I'm a deputy editor of the Annals of Internal Medicine. Our journal started in 1927. It is published by the American College of Physicians, uh, which is a little grandiose because it really refers to internal medicine physicians. Internal medicine really became a specialty in the 1920s, 1930s. We are very broadly defined in terms of what, uh, who our audience is. It includes internists who, in the United States, since there are people from other countries, have had medical school and a three-year residency, maybe more subspecialty training. But we also have many readers who are emergency physicians, pediatricians, pediatric emergency physicians, as one of my daughters is, uh, nurses and nurse practitioners, as another one of my daughters is, uh, and uh, all kinds of other specialties, including family medicine, which I think is uh, extremely important to us. So we have a very broad readership. In terms of overdiagnosis, in our view, it is our readers who are at the front lines of all the controversy that we're discussing today. And what we try to do is to bring the very best science we can to that discussion, as I'm sure my colleagues uh, will also talk about in terms of their own journals. We have some terrific people involved, including Cindy Mulrow, whom many of you know, who is a real expert in comparative effectiveness research, systematic reviews, meta-analyses. That is a very core uh, type of publication for us. 
If I look at what we've been publishing in the area of overdiagnosis, just looking at prostate cancer alone, um, first of all, we publish the US PSTF uh, guidelines. I think many of you know that. They come out in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And we usually accompany that by uh, uh, publishing some of the background work. So in prostate disease, we uh, published a paper at the end of 2011 from Roger Chu and Associates <clears throat> that was one of the background papers for the guidelines, published the guidelines themselves, for, uh, published an in the balance uh, uh, companion piece to the guidelines, one view by Otis Brawley, I think Dr. Brawley has left, but one by him and one by William Catalona and a group of urologists with a very different view. Uh, and we also uh, are very keen on research and reporting methods and have published in the area of screening in that category as well as ideas and opinions, a very nice piece by Alan Francis, who I know is here on the DSM-5 uh, diagnostic criteria in psychiatry and the controversy around those. Probably the most important thing we do, in my view, is also include screening in patient summaries uh, and in our very popular in the clinic series. And this is important because much as we are struggling, our patients are struggling even more. So let me end with an, a quick anecdote from my dinner last night. Some folks at a table near me were having a dinner discussion. They were my era, kind of early post-war boomers, and so they were talking about PBS shows that they liked, like Antiques Roadshow, Downton Abbey, and Doc Martin, et cetera. But then they, they launched into medicine, and one mentioned that a friend had had an MRI for some reason, couldn't recall why, and they had picked up what she characterized as very early pancreatic cancer, they knew that pancreatic cancer was fatal, and in their view, this man had now been saved by this MRI. And what she said was, isn't this great? I think soon we will all have scans periodically. We'll have periodic scans, and then we're going to find all of these cancers early. And she went further. She said the other incredible thing she had read was that a very bright Stanford undergrad had patented a blood test kit where you could do all the usual routine tests on very tiny amounts of blood and apparently is negotiating with Walgreens or someplace to roll this out. And the woman said, this is great news because we can now go and get our blood tested all the time. And she said, as you know, when your white blood cell count goes up, that's early cancer. So we're gonna find it that way too. So random conversation last night. I, I suspect these folks were not attending this meeting, but <laughs> if they were, I wish they'd spoken up because we would have gotten a very different view. So I've been delighted to be here. I think we're gonna have a sort of panel questions and, and happy to answer other questions about the annals, but we are very committed to sorting out what I think is one of the most exciting uh, areas right now. If you look at our citations, the, the first one that says overdiagnosis is in 1988, and then there's one in 1993 about thyroid cancer, and then they're taking off, much like an epidemic. So uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, good morning. Um, appreciate very much the opportunity to, uh, to be here. I was uh, drafted at the last moment because Deborah Grady, uh, who is uh, one of the JAMA Internal Medicine uh, deputy editors and has really spearheaded our efforts in this area, was, wasn't able to make it, so I'll fill in as best I can. Uh, JAMA Internal Medicine uh, used to be called the Archives of Internal Medicine, uh, same journal, different name as of uh, January of uh, this year. Uh, I joined the editorial group uh, in December, uh, so many of the uh, things which I'm talking about were in place well before I started. Uh, the current editor-in-chief, Rita Redberg, who's a cardiologist uh, based at UC San Francisco, and uh, Deborah Grady, uh, who I actually know from when she was an intern, because uh, that's where I trained as well, um, and is a uh, general internist, uh, expert in women's health and various uh, research methods. The two of them have really spearheaded uh, many of our uh, efforts uh, related to uh, overdiagnosis and related topics, and uh, such articles can be found in many different uh, areas of the, uh, the journal, from uh, original research uh, to uh, commentaries to uh, systematic reviews to shorter research letters to uh, uh, perspectives of uh, personal experiences, whether they be of uh, patients or uh, family members um, or uh, physicians. And recently, um, Rita Redberg herself wrote about her 
own experience with uh, surgery for thyroid cancer and a, an interesting personal reflection about how she and her doctors approached the topic uh, uh, a number of years ago when, uh, when she had surgery. Uh, so there's a lot of wealth of material in our journal, which I think is related to the, uh, to the topic of this conference. Uh, we have one particular series which has uh, received some attention called Less is More, and I think I have the diagnosis right that to be considered uh, less is more, it, it has to be uh, no benefit and substantial harm. So uh, something which hypothetically is overdiagnosis and there's no benefit, but there's really no harm, perhaps except for the, the time involved, the expense of the diagnostic procedures, uh, we wouldn't consider that less is more. We wouldn't necessarily consider it as something to be endorsed or emulated, but, but less is more. Um, which is a series that um, Deborah and Rita launched, I, I think three going on four years ago now, uh, is specifically meant to uh, address situations in medicine where we see no benefit and the uh, potential for substantial harm. So some of the things which are being talked about at this conference I think would fall into that category and others would not. We, we try to be fairly strict internally in terms of what we uh, put that classification on. Um, in general, and I hope we'll come back to this in the, uh, in the discussion. I, I think that articles about overdiagnosis, as really articles about everything else uh, in medicine, fall into some fairly standard um, uh, selection criteria. Uh, just to give one example, uh, if something is new, if we don't know about something, it's probably appropriate to bring it to our attention uh, and describe a phenomena. Uh, at a certain point when one is describing a phenomena for the sixth time in the sixth different population, et cetera, it becomes less interesting and the question moves because how are we going to advance the field? So perhaps we advance the field by having a study and comparing two different, we know that there's overdiagnosis in a particular area, you name it, uh, and how do we do something about that? Uh, do we have an intervention? Uh, do we have a trial where we try to two different things and see which one works better so we can learn from something? So it's always, we hope, a shifting bar because we're interested, as I'm sure my colleagues on, on the panel are too, in things which will make a difference to physicians, which will make a difference to their patients, which will somehow advance the field. And if science is working properly, the, the bar is changing and, and what is going to advance the field is changing because other studies have already advanced the, uh, the field. Uh, just one final comment, I think in general as an editor, um, I'm often interested in appropriate diagnosis uh, in addition to overdiagnosis. I think we all know that one can do things uh, too much, one can also do things too little. Hopefully there's a balance if we know what's right, sometimes we don't know what's right. Uh, a number of years ago our, our journal called attention in a, in a study uh, to uh, the number of people who were at average risk for uh, colon cancer who were getting screened more frequently than the recommended interval of 10 years. Uh, that didn't seem like a good idea for the patients. Uh, it created uh, some expense to the healthcare system and uh, some income to, to people who perhaps did colonoscopies. Uh, but on the other hand, we have a problem in this country where some people aren't screened at all. And somewhere we have to find something in the middle which, uh, which makes more sense for the whole population. So thank you once again and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand because I saw some data the other day that sitting kills. <laughs> yeah, let's hope it's not true. Um, so, so the BMJ has been around for a long time, 1840, uh, the first edition. Uh, it's changed quite a lot since then, but really from an early stage, it was a combination of science, commentary, and journalism. And I, I think that's a tradition that has been continued, and it's one that I'm very... Um, keen to continue. Uh, there's a risk in that mix uh, that people will think the science isn't as rigorous as it should be or the journalism isn't as, um, you know, uh, readable as it should be. And so we, we, we try to overcome that risk by working really hard at both. Um, our aim is to drive the debate internationally on health and health care and to help doctors make better decisions. Um, we uh, work very hard on the research side of things to try to make the science as relevant and, and, and uh, uh, rigorous as possible, as I, as I know all my colleagues on the big journals do and on other journals too. Uh, we have open peer review, we have open access to the research, both of which um, I think fit with our sense that transparency is, is better than uh, not transparency. Um, we 
have, however, developed also in a back, against the background of rigorous science, um, journalism and investigative journalism, and that's reflected, I think, by the fact that attending this meeting with me are my colleague Ed Davis, who's a, who's a medical journalist who's based in the US now in New York, and Dr. Elizabeth Loder, who's um, one of our senior research editors based in Boston um, at Brigham and Women's, and, and is a, is a, um, a um, headache expert as well as being an editor on the journal. So we, we have the kind of two faces that we show to the world, and we try to use those in a, in a kind of um, uh, consistent fashion, working on issues that we think are important. Um, the wonderful thing about the journalism is it allows us to work with great people like Shannon Brownlees and Jeannie Lemza and um, Steve and Lisa, who I know aren't journalists but work very closely with journalists and write fantastically well. And also the amazing Ray Moynihan, who um, had already worked with the BMJ when I first um, became editor. And I just thought briefly I'll tell you a little uh, anecdote about something Ray wrote um, a few years ago, I think in... in uh, one of his uh, collaborators on the ideas behind this was Iona Heath, who's also here. Um, it was, a, it was uh, published in, a, in an issue which had the date April the 1st on it, which in the UK is a, a date which allows us to do things that we wouldn't might otherwise do. And we published a news story about a, um, a new drug that had been developed because there was a condition afflicting one in five Australians called motivational deficit disorder, motivational deficiency disorder. Um, so bad that it was uh, people were just stuck to their sofas and couldn't move. And um, this marvellous man, Leth Argos, had developed this new drug called Indalab Indelabant, which was so successful that one of these sufferers had um, moved from his sofa to become a successful banker in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so we published this article, and um, it was pretty... I think some people realised <laughs> what was going on. But uh, a New the New Zealand Herald picked it up and covered it as a serious story. And <laughs> was very upset when he discovered he'd been spoofed and sent me an email saying, Dr. Gardley, credibility is hard. Sorry, Australian accent, I can't do it. Uh, <laughs> credibility, New Zealand accent, credibility is hard one. You have damaged both yours and mine. So I <laughs> but <laughs> more in the spirit of the thing, we got a fantastic rapid response which said, we discovered this disease several years ago but couldn't be bothered to write it up. <laughs> So just to finish, um, the, the journalism and the research allows us to do um, campaigns. We do think of ourselves as a campaigning to edit, um, journal. And the Too Much Medicine campaign, which I think works very closely uh, with the, with the um, Less Is More, with the Choosing Wisely, lots of things going on. The Too Much Medicine campaign aims to highlight overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And we're also um, busy with an open data campaign, which is to try to get the data from clinical trials um, widely available for external independent scrutiny. Thank you very much. So, um, listening to the the discussion and the descriptions of the journals, I, I think I would like to start by asking each one of you to respond to the question of whether journals, and I, I'll have to give you just a little bit of background. Um, one is that I was raised as the child of a journalist. My father's a newspaper editor. And he felt strongly and communicated strongly uh, to, to us that um, the newspaper reports the news, it doesn't make the news. And so the media are meant to be independent and meant to provide um, a non-opinionated side. So should journals be doing something to try to prevent overdiagnosis? Dr. Patton. You were saying, should they be activists? Or yeah. yeah, in fact, that was the word I wrote um, down. Yeah, well, you know, I think that activism has a huge, huge role in, in this. And obviously, again, I'm speaking as someone who worked in AIDS where activism was clearly part of the, a big part of the uh, dramatic solution. I don't think that we should be activists. I think that it's hard for us as individuals, certainly, uh, not to have a position. But I'm not sure. Um, even at this point, that as a person, I have a position about overdiagnosis. But I, I think the job of the journals is to present the evidence, interpretation, clearly label what is opinion from what is original research. We do that with our ideas and opinions category, our in the balance, dual uh, presentations. Um, but I think that we should not be um, uh, advocates. 
Now, you should also note that I am not the editor-in-chief of the Annals of Internal Medicine. That's Christine Lane, who couldn't be with us today. I think she could probably give a more eloquent response, but that's how I feel. I think that we need to be the commons. We need to be where everybody feels they can come and publish, and we should be blind to the position that the science should speak for itself. Robert. It's, it's a difficult question because I think at some level we are activists or not activists whether we want to be or not. Let me explain. Uh, every journal makes some decision at the end of the day as to what it, how it defines itself, what it wants to publish. And the articles that we uh, publish, any journal, in some sense are a reflection of the collective editorial process. And so if we decide to highlight certain types of studies uh, for whatever reason, including I would hope that they're good science and that they're interesting to the people who read the journal, we're, we're, we're making a, a statement about something. Um, we don't have, uh, at least in our journal, sort of collective editorials, the, the opinion of the, the journal. They're, they're all signed uh, by individual editors, including uh, an uh, editorial written by the, by the editor-in-chief. And I think that in the context of particular topics or articles, when editors write an editorial within reason and with credibility and accuracy, they uh, should say what they think and thus uh, provide a, a service to, uh, to readers. Uh, so I, I do think at a, at a general level, because we've chosen to uh, publish a number of articles which in the general theme of, of this conference, I mean, we're saying something as opposed to publishing none of those articles. But on the other hand, if, if we begin to editorialize and got a limb about uh, studies which are bad science, I, I, we're, we're not doing anybody any favors. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one. There's, I think uh, journals select, uh, they are a kind of curated thing, and they therefore, the editors are responsible for selecting from things that get sent to them and also inviting commentary. So there is, there is judgment, there is sub subjectivity there. So it's kind of, you're already, you're already over the objectivity, subjectivity line quite a long way by the time you're involved in editing a journal, but I think it is important that any journal be as open as possible to uh, the range of voices on any particular issue. Um, I've already been accused, perhaps with some justification of, of editorial bias since I've been here, around some of the stuff that we've published on overdiagnosis, overscreening, and, and I worry about that. I, do, I think that that's, a, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing um, to fall into. So what I hope for the BMJ and for other journals is that we are a platform for many voices, and that um, certainly um, we aim very hard to be open to criticism of what we publish. We have a very open rapid response uh, policy um, and we really encourage and want that discussion. So if, if our um, positioning is considered to be too strong or unjustified, we want, we want people to tell us that and to send in counter arguments. But I think, I think journals are, uh, do have an advocacy role. I think there are so many things in the world that, that need commenting on, and that advocacy can come from both the editors with signed editorials, but also very much from those in the community who have a, a really strong point and well-justified point to make. So I, I think I'm, I'm comfortable with allowing the journal to take positions through, through its community of, of, of um, authors. So it seems that all three of the, of the journals represented here have taken a position um, in the sense of, of sponsoring, for example, the Less is More um, section. Um, or um, the uh, or participating um, in the Choosing Wisely campaign, um, uh, and so I'm wondering how, if you can describe how those choices are made at your journal. Do they just happen organically? Is there a, is there a process for making decisions? Um, within the journal, if somebody in this uh, audience felt strongly about something and wanted to bring that to the journal, how would that, how would that happen? I'll start from this side. Okay, so the different types of content we ca carry have different sort of li life, life path through the journal. Um, so the research obviously submitted, we'll, we'll, we'll assess that in, in, I think, really very objective and rigorous ways. Um, the other content is both submitted and commissioned. So. Um, very much we rely on people sending us stuff because we can't know everything that's going on. If someone writes us a very compelling piece, even if we don't necessarily agree with it, obviously we will want to publish that um, and see what the community has to say about, about that. Um, but even when it comes to the research side of things, we do direct, we do, journals do direct people's attention by doing calls for papers and we've published a, a theme issue that Elizabeth Loder um, curated on 
missing hidden trial data, which I think was very successful. It published one of the most influential articles around the fact that the FDA Amendment Act hadn't yet had the effect that we had hoped on that score. We're going to have a call for papers in, in, as a result of this meeting, hoping that you, those of you who presented really good science here will send us those papers. And so the very act of having a call for papers is, is, a, is an, an invitation to mm -hmm. focus on that issue. Um, yeah. So, and, then, and then we could commission the journalism and, and edit that in, through, through editorial meetings where we try to have a sense of what we think are the important issues that we can cover. I think there, that's something of a difference between um, for JAMA Internal Medicine and, and for Annals. And, and I was deputy editor of pediatrics for some time and so also speak a little bit from, from the perspective of an editor. The, the very large journals like BMJ, like JAMA, um, have journalism. They have news and the smaller journals are constrained in part by resources and in part by time um, for being able to, uh, to include journalism as, uh, in addition to the science and, and the opinion. Um, so how does, yeah, speaking for JAMA Internal Medicine, and I don't know if you can comment on how JAMA does this as well. Uh, I'm sorry, do, does what? Uh, the the uh, making decisions about if, if you're going to take a position, if you're going to um, uh, encourage a particular thing, the, what, what Fee talked about with uh, theme issues right. or... So, so JAMA, I, I can't speak for the editorial processes of JAMA, but I, I, I can say, as we all know, that, that JAMA does have theme issues with calls for papers, and, and clearly a, a theme issue uh, is saying that the editors are interested in that topic, whether it's uh, violence uh, internationally or it's cardiovascular disease or uh, uh, genomics. Uh, that they're, they're, and so some of these may be interpreted as a purely scientific topic or something with a, a bit more of a social dimension, but it is saying something of, of interest. We, we don't um, uh, have uh, theme issues. We often will put things together, either because they happen to arrive at the same time and they're a, a package of articles about thyroid cancer, or what have you, and we may invite some, uh, some viewpoints which provide more of a commentary. We may have a viewpoint uh, which arrived and we decide that it's pretty good and we decide to publish it. And some of these things sort of happen by uh, serendipity. And occasionally we might go out and commission an article because we know that we have some, uh, some other content. I, I should just say one thing about JAMA and the other sort of JAMA network journals. We're, we're joined together. We have the same publishing platform. We, we follow many standard procedures in terms of formatting and categories of articles and things like that. But we're all editorial independent. Uh, so we will sometimes, with author's permission, uh, uh, consider manuscripts which have uh, uh, not received a favorable decision at JAMA, but uh, we are, it's an editorially independent uh, decision. Uh, so it's a network of journals, but uh, the decisions about particular manuscripts can be different in part because the journals are different, and one is uh, really with an internal medicine focus, and for example, we don't publish too much neonatology. I don't see why not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, we aren't part of a, of a network, uh, so we are an independent journal. Um, we don't have theme issues. I don't know how that tradition started, but we don't have it. We've discussed it and, and rejected that as an idea, at least uh, till now. We had one sort of theme-like issue a couple of years ago that was sort of a special case. Uh, so we don't do that. I'd say that our editorials are, tend to be invited and tend to be, accompany original research. So after original research is accepted, uh, usually uh, Christine solicits an editorial. We occasionally write an editorial uh, either as an individual uh, editor or as a group of editors. So we did write an editorial not too long ago about uh, gun violence, which definitely took a position that it was time for the United States to get serious about gun violence as a public health issue. And that was at the time that we published a paper documenting what had happened in Australia after the mass shooting in the late 90s and <clears throat> what had happened then. So we do it on occasion, um, but, um, but we aren't part of any kind of larger uh, journal network. We are published by the American College of Physicians. They do have their own publications. Uh, ACP Hospitalist is one. Uh, we do share some um, uh, platform in terms of internet platform, web pages, et cetera. For the, the um, BMJ is related to the BMA? Joined at the hip. 
Um, <laughs> we're owned by the BMA. We we actually have a, there's a, a wholly owned subsidiary publishing group which which uh, which runs the BMJ, and we have editorial independence. But uh, we provide our print journal and open a and access to the website to all BMA members. So it has a very wide print readership in the UK, um, but we give that to them free, and then we get the advertising off the back of that. So it's a kind of controlled circulation in the UK. Um, but the BMA is a very, very good parent to the journal. It doesn't um, interfere. Um, I wave very happily across the courtyard to them, and we don't have much interaction. <laughs> <laughs> AMA? Any? I, I can't. I can't comment uh, specifically. I, I, I think that uh, we view ourselves as fairly editorially independent of things which are happening at the uh, at the AMA. It's same. <clears throat> uh, Christine is uh, has a title, senior vice president of publishing, for the American College of Physicians. But <clears throat> uh, it really is not a. Um, it's an. It's a. It, it's a firewall. Yeah. No vetting of editorial positions, which would be separate from, from uh, decisions about scientific papers. Sorry, say again. Vetting of editorial decisions, so Maybe. if you're going to take an editorial position. I, I think, I mean, most journal owners have understood by now the real <coughs> importance of editorial independence. They realize it does them credit and it does them uh, commercial and um, intellectual benefit. So I, I think it's a, I, I hope it's a battle that's been long won. Um, certainly in our case it is. So um, I have one more question, and then um, we'll open it up to the floor for comments. But I'd, I'd love to hear your response to something that Barry said the other day. And I'm, I saw Barry this morning, so I know he's here someplace. There he is. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, this, was in, this was specifically in regard to a particular article um, that was published not too long ago in a journal that is not represented here, um, where the science was, was not good. Um, and in fact, the science was extremely poor. And, uh, but the article's gotten a lot of press. And so looking at the article, anyone who with, with a background in epidemiology is aware that the, that the piece is scientifically very poor. Presumably, the editors at some point become aware that the, that the science is very poor. And having had the experience of having published a really terrible article in, uh, in pediatrics when, when I was deputy editor there, and I have to say, it didn't come out of my office, but that's really no excuse because I was on the committee that vetted all the articles. Um, what Barry said was that when a, when a plane goes down, the, uh, the FAA doesn't uh, say, gosh, I hope that doesn't happen again. What they do is that they look for what happened and why. So um, could you describe an experience publishing something that perhaps you wish you hadn't published and, and what the response of the journal is? Uh, I think all editors publish things they, they uh, might regret uh, subsequently. I mean, the BMJ's approach to this has always been to be as open, well, certainly in, since the internet, um, has been as open as possible to the criticism. And we, we really live by that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I hope people here feel that that, that is the, the case, that we, you can put a criticism, I and mean, Peter Gotch has had people criticizing his stuff on bmj.com. He always comes back very strongly, so they have to come back again and again. I mean, you know, we, we really do live by the fact that we expect people to come forward and criticize. So if we published a paper that, we, that, that the community out there really thought was very poor, we would expect to have an incredibly strong signal on the website. And I'm happy to say that, that, that for the research we've published, that hasn't happened to the extent that we felt the need to take action, such as a retraction or, or an editorial um, expression of concern. Um, I, I think journal editors and journals absolutely do hold responsibility for what they publish. And at some point, if that, the criticism is so severe, the editors are already invested in the decision to publish that piece. And I think they should step back and get other people to have a look in and take a view of whether the article should stand or not. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, I, I think that you can look at journals and you can see a range of responses. Uh, the letters, and this is before the era of rapid responses and comments on the web and blogging, and we get all sorts of that sort of stuff immediately now. Uh, uh, the letters are a means to uh, air criticisms with responses from the authors. Uh, many uh, criticisms do have an effective response, and one can decide 
whether to believe the, the criticism or the authors having seen both sides. I, I know, and this is from my days at the New England Journal, there were instances where we would publish a longer article, a, a sounding board, uh, uh, something which, which more got behind the scenes and provided a more informed look at what somebody perceived as the flaws with the study, uh, which n may not have been apparent to many people because they required more sophisticated analysis. Uh, unfortunately, I also think that there's a, a, a problem among uh, journals of, of sort of circling the wagons uh, and really strong criticism and you sort of bunker down and, and say we're not really going to engage the uh, substance. And, I think that's unfortunate. I mean, I, we all uh, take some ownership of what we publish and we want to want to think that it's right, but uh, sometimes things are flawed and it can be uh, from some uh, bias of the editors, it can be just from a, a failure of appropriate statistical view and there's always a question which wasn't asked and sometimes that question can, can cause something to unravel. But, but I do think that, uh, and I'm speaking only for myself, that, that journals, uh, people make mistakes and I think journals should, um, uh, be more open in general about willing to acknowledge them, willing to understand from them, and willing trying to not make them again. I don't have too much to add. We, we did have a recent <clears throat> somewhat uh, related issue where we published a uh, clinical observation of data from the recent bird flu epidemic in China, and then we heard from uh, someone in China a few days later that essentially the same paper had just been published in clinical infectious diseases. Um, in fact, we published online, they published online. I think it was less than 24 hours uh, between the two online publications. And so what we did basically uh, was basically write exactly what happens. This is what happened. We felt that we should not fully retract because there was some new information that was not redundant with the other article and therefore it might be of value, especially in a situation like that that was a public health emergency where people were looking for information. So because of that, we didn't fully retract it, but we certainly revealed everything that had happened and everything um, that we knew. I have not, while I've been at the journal, uh, we've not had a, um, a situation where we've had to retract. If you're interested in retraction, there's a yeah. great blog, great. you know, about retraction. Yeah. Dot or Retraction Watch. Retraction Watch. Uh, these folks, spent, they must work 24-7 finding it. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting to me is that while we think about uh, uh, research fraud in, in the biomedical sense, it seems that there's a whole lot more in other areas. I mean, there are, as, if you, as you've probably seen from PubMed, I've seen physics articles where there are literally four to 500 authors. So um, Retraction Watch, is a, it, it's fun. It can, it can kind of load up here email sometimes, but I had no idea how much was out there. Can I just ask Barry, did, did the um, journal in question publish, has, have their critical letters appeared in the journal, in, have critical letters appeared in the it's journal in question? Oh, it's only just come out. Yeah. Where's our sound guy? We need this mic over here. There you go. It's on. Okay, You're thanks. Here. Um, so the article that we were uh, discussing, Ginny and I, was one that came out too, too soon for there to be an exchange um, yet, but I understand it's, in, will it's be. in the works, and a journal editor in question initially, um, when pressed, said, well, that's not the role of the editor. The editor is to sort of publish what's out there and let things play out. Um, but then there were some voices that said, uh, no, the role of an editor goes beyond being simply passive. Otherwise, there wouldn't be an editor. We would just have copy editors, and anything that came in would get out there. And as you know, as well as I, that um, it's a very heavy responsibility of um, the editor-in-chief to really make sure that the top science gets in. Now, the, um, Deborah just brought up a point that is not exactly the type of issue that, we, that I was talking about with the plane crash. Um, because, yes, as an editor, um, and as some of you know, I was an editor for over 18 years, um, there were times where w when we would find something had been published same time, but I didn't um, say to myself, gee, that's a plain crash from my standpoint. Um, something, I did something at fault. Clearly, the authors were at fault, and we took great um, we went to great lengths to let them know how much at fault we thought they were. 
and communicated with yeah, others. I haven't talked about what went on behind the scenes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, but I'm talk I was talking about the article that at first glance, you could tell something went wrong. And the analogy to the plane crash is, in essence, 20, for a plane to crash, you say to yourself, at least 20 things had to go wrong because there's so many steps that led to the crash and any one of them might have averted it and you have teams of people looking at it and um, that the, the same analogy goes for um, journal articles that really are very weak and a real problem and then you have to say um, at almost every level um, the night it came into the editor-in-chief's debt, depending on how the, the journal works. Um, did it get through me? Was that my error that I even sent it out to the associate editors? Was it their error to send it out to reviewers? Was it the reviewers' editors uh, that they missed something horrible? Was it the statistical reviewers' fault that they missed something horrible? When it came back in um, and the associate editor looked at it again, was there an error, did they respond to all the reviews, and then it goes to the editorial board and ultimately um, the editor-in-chief. And at every level, there just has to be an error. To, it, it's like um, you try to set up journals, and again, you know this better than I, like Swiss cheese. You yeah. slice the cheese and you make sure that none of the holes go straight through directly. <laughs> Um, and if something manages to make it through every hole of the Swiss cheese, then something really went uh, badly. And that's what used to keep me going, um, thinking if someone would tell me such an error might have been made, that's what would keep me up. And I would really investigate and look into exactly where all the errors occurred. Yeah, where'd that happen? Thank you, Barry. So um, I'd like to open up for questions if people have comments. A couple of editorial questions. So I'm just reading the global statement here. If I published an article that said combat perverse incentives that turn too many people into patients, I suspect that I might be, have so my. Just say, say that again, it was a little unclear. If you combat perverse incentives that turn too many people into patients. I suspect that if I put that in a manuscript that I submitted to one of your journals, you'd either reject it or, or ask me to change that. And the, the second question I have for you is, the, the statement about minimizing professional and financial conflicts of interest among expert panels. Um, and, and ask you the question, why journals don't ask questions about conflicts of interest with relation to payers? So for example, the Dartmouth Institute publishes widely on overdiagnosis bias. Is there research funded by payers, for example, Blue Cross? And if so, is that not a, a potential conflict of interest that the readers of your journals should be made aware of? Thank you. So questions of, of conflict of interest outside of pharma. Very nice, very nice point. I think, I think you're right. I think we have, we have blind spots around certain types of conflicts of interest. Um, and public sector, um, people who are paid within the public sector, you know, have a <laughs> tendency to think the public sector is, you know, a good thing. Um, and I have to say that is a bias of mine. Um, and that commercial influence is rather less of a good thing. But I think we have to be much more ready to spot those blind spots. I'm afraid I don't know about the, the situation at Dartmouth. Perhaps someone here could answer that. But I, I would absolutely acknowledge that we need to be, have a much bright, broader appreciation of what we mean by conflict of interest. In response to your first question, I don't, I don't think if it was in a, 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 a this is, this is, a, 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 this is in, to yet to be finalized, this statement, obviously. Right. If this statement appeared in an opinion piece signed, I don't think we would have a problem with that. I mean, okay. I think that's perfectly fine. Well, I think it's good to know that it's still going to be edited. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think Bray can speak to that. This is, a, this is a, 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 an oh, answer. Comments about conflict of interest in particular? Oh, I, I generally uh, uh, agree that we, we have to be alert to broader issues of conflicts, and it, it comes down to the, uh, disclosure in some instances, and I, I think it, it is a factor at some level in editorial decisions, but I'm speaking, you know, very generally, and one, one, one um, needs to, to look at uh, particular uh, particular manuscripts. I would uh, agree that for where the statement of the sorts of sentences you just read, it really depends on the context. Um, some things are fine, and opinion pieces not fine, and conclusions of research articles. 
Um, yeah, I think we try to get people, we have policy that people have to disclose all kinds of conflict um, on their disclosure form. I think the whole conflict issue is very difficult. I do think transparency, simply stating it, goes a long way. Um, it is very difficult, as you know now, to find people who are experts in many areas of medicine who are not consulting for an astonishing range of uh, pharma, usually, <laughs> companies, but other conflict as well. I served on an FDA advisory panel uh, many years ago, and we had to state conflict. And often, if at that point, which was, uh, I think, a little earlier in the game, if you had uh, significant pharma consulting or other uh, relationships, certainly an equity position, you couldn't be on the committee. Uh, and then one person was on the committee, and I swear the guy had 25 different uh, associations. And I asked somebody at the FDA, and they said, well, he has so many. He basically consults for every known pharmaceutical company <laughs> or other entity that has anything to do with this disease, so we figure all the conflict pretty much cancels out. <laughs> I, so, so I, I want to I want to go over that's a true story. people okay. waiting for questions. True story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Leonor Tifa from uh, New York. So I have a question about leadership. So we're here uh, to talk about professional and cultural change. Change doesn't occur without many elements. One of which I think is leadership. And my sense, um, there's nobody here from the New England Journal, but my sense is that between Fiona and Marsha Angel, we have seen a great deal of leadership and responsibility uh, for taking leadership in, in this new direction so that the credibility uh, of the journals doesn't rely exclusively on objectivity or scientific uh, criteria, but on professionalism and a sense of public responsibility. I think this is a new vocabulary or an unfamiliar vocabulary. I think it's a vocabulary more for crusaders, but there is a noble history uh, of crusade. In, and I wonder if people would be brave enough to embrace that kind of vocabulary and vision of leadership uh, as we try to create a new movement. Thank you. Comments? I think the crusaders had a sticky end, so I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, we have very little time left, so, so let's see. Paul. Well, a quick question. I um, wanted to gr congratulate all of the journals, first of all, on the series that they're doing, the US Task Force things, Less is More, the Too Much Medicine series. These are really great stuff um, and bring a credibility to um, overdiagnosis problems that writing books and media articles, which raises awareness but doesn't get the credibility with clinicians. So it's really, really important stuff. And I just wanted to ask about your plans for making this stuff, which is more, um, more of public interest, um, open access at some stage in the future. Open access. Um, I mean, all the BMJ's research is open access. The, uh, the, 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 the um, overdiagnosis series that Tessa Richards has been curating, um, we've done four articles now. I'm pretty sure that. Oh, they're not. That's an error. They, they should be. Sometimes it just, they're, if they're not automatically, we just need to keep reminding. So they're, they're, I'm pretty sure they will be. I have to check that. Okay, um, I'll chase we them. have to make some money somehow. So our subscription depends on having some stuff behind access controls. And that's, that's a tricky balance. But I mean, the, the, the attempt is to get these as widely out there as possible. Great. Uh, I'm not the expert on access to uh, the JAMA network journals, but I will say that we have a web app and uh, many things are more easily available if you access the content through the web app than if you access it in other ways, and you might want to see what's available. Okay, I checked yeah, about. Uh, we make decisions at, at the time we set up the print issue. As we go down each article, we make a decision on which will be open access. Uh, and, uh, you know, the criteria vary, but certainly anything that has an immediate public health impact that we believe could affect decision-making, treatment decisions in a way that is significant for patients, uh, we do open access. But it is a, a joint effort um, line by line. And I can speak for pediatrics and say that, that uh, we do exactly the same thing. We make certain our, um, of the science open access, but the opinion is actually open access uh, from the beginning. What isn't open access is the review articles, because that's what people so desperately want. <laughs> That's right. We have time for one last question. Okay, okay. Peter Gertcher, 
Deborah Cotton talked about that it was difficult to find experts that didn't have conflicts of interest. In fact, one third of American professors are not on industry payroll, so the industry hasn't succeeded to buy everyone yet. Yeah, they're mostly and, pediatricians. And, and even, even in my little country, <laughs> it's possible to find experts who are not on industry payroll. So please stop the whining. You have to, you have to choose your, uh, what your moral values are. And lawyers cannot represent both sides. You are aware of that. Why do doctors think they can? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I think I think we're I think we're just about out of time. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Let me uh, do just a couple of, of uh, housekeeping items before we move on to the next session, which um, will begin immediately. Um, and so, uh, and Fiona will be moderating that session just so that you hear this and you'll hear it again at the end of this session. The uh, schedule for the morning has been adjusted slightly. Um, recognizing that the uh, shuttle to Boston Logan leaves at noon. And so the decision has been made that our break from ten, at 10 o'clock will be a very short one. This is a scoop up your um, coffee or tea and move on to your, uh, to your next obligation, which is uh, workshops and work groups that will be meeting not at 10.30 but at 10.15. And those will go to 11.15 and then we will be back in this room from 11.15 until 12 for the, for the final session. So just a little housekeeping. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.